name is Jeff Oaks. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, we're on this program because we really believe that lives and culture can be transformed through the proclamation of truth and love. And we know this reality, and that is that God is love, and Jesus said that He is the truth. And so I want to thank you for taking this time and, and joining. We're here on Sunday mornings from 6.30 to 7 a.m., and we're going to go ahead and do something a little different. We're going to jump right into a message that took place here at Hosanna Fellowship last week. And so uh, we hope that it will bless you and that it will challenge you in your walk with Jesus. Thessalonians chapter 5. We're going to just look at the first 11 verses of the chapter. And here we go. But concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness, so that this day should overtake you as a thief. You are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you also are doing. So we're looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Paul has just spent some verses in comforting the saints in chapter 4 about those who have fallen asleep. The main thrust in his message in the latter part of chapter 4 is that they will not miss out on what is to come with the Lord's return. But Paul was letting the church know they will have a front row seat. So if you think about this, if you have a bunch of people, you've just come to Christ, he's concerned about everybody. Some people have already died. They've just come to Christ, but, and the church was just born, and he's calling, he's writing to find out about them. They've already sent some messengers there to figure out what's happening with the church, and some people had already died. And we don't know exactly why they died, but maybe they died because of sickness. And, and they're concerned about them because they're thinking, okay, as a part of the gospel message, Jesus is coming back. That's an important reality. So few people even preach this reality, but that's a part of this basic gospel message, is that Jesus is coming back to rule and to reign on the earth. And yet we go, well, I mean, he hasn't come back yet. And, and, and the Lord even warns us through uh, the Apostle Peter that there will be people at the end of the age that will be saying, well, where's the promise of his coming? And they will mock those that talk about it. And that's true today. It's really true today. But Paul was trying to reassure the church that those that had fallen asleep are not going to miss it. As a matter of fact, they're going to have a, a front row seat. They're going to be right there involved in Jesus' return. And that's exciting news because that means the people, loved ones that you, that died in the Lord, guess what? You're going to be reunited with them. And I think a lot of time we spend a lot of time thinking about, well, what's heaven going to be like? It's going to be, we're going to have a big party together. And that's true. We are going to have a big party together. But the reality is we're going to see Jesus. He's the first and foremost uh, aspect of heaven that's going to really catch all of our attention. And then we'll get to hang out with our brothers and sisters in Christ. And maybe they're our parents, and, and, and of course, they're probably not going to look like they did when you saw them. I think I mentioned last time that when I was talking about this, you may look like you were when you were 33. I, that's not very promising to me. But anyway, you know, that's what David Pawson suggested, that we'll all look like Jesus at 33. And uh, I'm like, well, I don't know, maybe let's go a little further down, you know, maybe 22 or something like that. But anyway, they may not look like they did, but you'll know them and you'll be reunited with them. And he's telling them that. As a matter of fact, Paul goes on to say basically this. He doesn't really say this, but it is kind of interesting that he likens death to just going to sleep. Right. So get this. 
you practice dying every night. For a believer, that's what death is. It's just going to sleep. And guess what? You wake up in his presence. What a, what a tremendous comfort that is. I mean, literally, we, we have such a fear of death, and people are bound by a fear of death, and rightfully so. If you don't know Christ, there is a fear in dying. How many people do you know hate going to sleep because they know they're going to be tormented all night in their dreams? Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not asking for hands, but I've known people that way. They hated going to sleep because they did, their sleep was not sweet. There was no peace. And there's no peace for those that don't know Christ. But for those of us who do, guess what? It's like laying down and going, and going to sleep. So, in chapter 5 though, he shifts his emphasis from the believers who have fallen to sleep to the return of the Lord himself. And this was the burning question even the apostles had for Jesus on the day he ascended into heaven. If you'll remember in Acts 1, he says, Lord, some of them say, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it's not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. However, here, Paul says to the saints, concerning the times and seasons, brethren, you have no need for me to write to you. Now, why is there no need for him to write to them about this? I mean, I would say all of us are in a situation where we're thinking, you know, I don't know probably enough about the return of Christ. I may know about the, the after workings of it, but I'm still looking for how do I know when he's coming? And we've got people that write books and make lots of money, and they have all kinds of uh, videos and teachings about it, and, and we've got one over there. I mean, there's all kinds of books about the return of Christ and people uh, you know, conjecturing about it and, and taking the Scripture and, and, and laying it out in an organized way. I'm not saying that there, there's not any kind of, uh, of uh, uh, logic behind it, but I'm simply saying there's a lot of things that people write and teach and preach about because people do have this burning question. When's he coming back? And yet Paul says, you don't have any need for me to write to you about this. Now, why? Number one, maybe because those things are going to work themselves out. You can't control it. Now, some would say, well, maybe we do have something to do with the return of Christ. Matthew 24, 14, which says, and this gospel will be preached to the ends of the earth, then the end will come. And so we're like, we got to be about the Great Commission, guys. we got to be teaching, preaching. we got to be making disciples across the earth. And I wholeheartedly agree. But that's being obedient to the Great Commission and in being obedient to the Great Commission, guess what's going to happen? The gospel is being preached to every part of the world. In other words, God is working through his people to accomplish his own will. So a lot of times, maybe it's the fact that Paul's saying, I, there's no need for me to write to you about this, because you really can't do anything about it. It's coming, it's going to happen, but you're not to be anxious about it. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And the God of peace shall mount guard over your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. In other words, you can't add any more seconds to it being accomplished by you being anxious about it then you can stop it by being anxious about it. In other words, God has set the time. And there's no reason for him to write about it. That's one, one perspective about it. The second perspective is this. And I think it kind of lends itself more towards the second perspective. And that is this. There's no need for me to write to you about it because the Holy Spirit will get you ready for his return in other words the holy spirit is going to be at work in you as a believer to get you ready for that day so you can't flip out like oh, i don't know if i'm going to be 
ready. Guess what? Who's, guess who's working with you? Holy Spirit. He's like, yeah, you know what? You're going to have to lay that one down. You've got to pick that one up. There's things that you're going to have to do. And as you do, as you're listening to him and you're obedient to him, guess what? He makes you ready. That's what sanctification is all about. It's about being made ready. Amen? So he, it goes on to say, because he reiterates that this event will occur with great stealth and surprise, I think there's a great question like, well, how will we know? <laughs> Paul likens the event to a thief in the night. By the way, he's not alone in that comparison because Jesus and Peter both refer to it in the same manner. Jesus refers to his own return in that way. It'll be like a thief in the night. It'll be a surprise. Uh, I, I think that there's something there because people on the whole will not be ready for his coming. Because they aren't ready. Period. He likens the contrast to what the world says in the hour to what really will happen. One says, well, everything's all right. There's, pe there's peace, there's safety, there's security. It's all right there in the passage. Yet in that moment is when the day of the Lord comes. And it will be sudden destruction for them and they will not escape is what the scripture says. Now this is, this is a very stark promise. It's a, very, it's a very drastic, it's a very alarming promise. There are going to be a lot of people that won't be ready. And as a matter of fact, they will be saying exactly the opposite of what's about to happen. And then it will come on them suddenly and they will be destroyed, the scripture says, and they will not escape. That's a warning that's what we should be saying to people. Listen, there is destruction coming. You've got to be ready. And they're like, you're nothing, but a, you're nothing but a chicken little. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. And we're like, no, no, no. Jesus is coming back. You've got to be ready for his return. It's going to come when you think everything's okay. That there's peace and there's safety and there's security. But then he's going to show up. And when he shows up, as I said to, uh, many weeks ago, he's not coming as a suffering servant. He's coming as a warring king. He's coming to make war. I know that that doesn't fit in a lot of your thought processes. But Jesus is coming back as a warrior. That's the Jesus of the Bible. Our job is to warn people of what's coming. And the great news is, is there's a way of escape. It's through the same one who's coming to make war. If you will come to him as Savior, then you will not be subjected to the destruction. You will escape the wrath that is coming. That's the gospel message. A lot of people go, well, we shouldn't talk about that kind of stuff. It just scares people. I don't know what to say to that. I, I, the reason I say that is I didn't come up with the message. I didn't write the message. This was what the apostles preached. In the book of Acts, that's what they preached. Paul preached this very message. We've got to tell people, listen, not only, not only can you be forgiven of your own sin and know what real peace is, that's great. Not only are you secured of, of an eternal home in heaven and, and you're going to escape eternal judgment, but... I want you to understand Jesus is coming back and when he comes back he's coming back as a warrior and those that are against him will be destroyed and if you're here when it happens woe be it unto you if you're not on his side in this Paul does not address particulars concerning the return of Christ 
other than reminding them this will not overtake them unaware and they are destined for something far better. In the second letter, though, he does talk about prerequisite events that have to take place before the return of the Lord. So you, you have to read 1 Thessalonians, but then you also have to read 2 Thessalonians. Because in 2 Thessalonians, he actually lays out some prerequisite events that will take place before Jesus comes back. I think it's because there were a lot of questions about the return of Christ after he wrote the first letter. Wouldn't you think? I mean, he's already written the first letter and they're going, okay, well then what do we need to know? And then he starts writing out what they do need to know. What is going to happen before Jesus comes back? And he gives them some prerequisite events that take place, which happen to be taken straight from Daniel taken straight from other Old Testament prophets like Zephaniah and Zechariah. These things he pulls out of the Old Testament to actually lay out his, uh, his apologetic for the return of Christ. Amen? Now, what's very interesting is in verse 8, Paul uses this little word, day. Now, <clears throat> Paul starts the sentence off with this word. It means but. The reader could have become lost in the thought that the return of the Lord can happen in such a way that none of us would be prepared for it. However, Paul uses this word but to clarify that the coming of the Lord to those who are in the light will not come on them like a thief. Now, this is important because for us that are in the light, this day should not overtake us and cause us to go, oh, it's here. We ought to be ready. There are things that the Holy Spirit will make alive to us that will prepare us. In addition to that, he says to the church that they are of the day and not of the night. And he talks about all the stuff that happens in the day and all the stuff that happens at night. And so he's telling them they should remain vigilant, sober, and watchful. Vigilant, sober, and watchful. What does it mean to you in your life to be vigilant, sober, and watchful? I want you to think about that question. And I want you to begin to maybe even write out this week, what does it mean to be vigilant? What does it mean to be sober? What does it mean to be watchful? How can I be a follower, a believer, a disciple of Jesus and be vigilant, be sober, and be watchful? Because if we are vigilant, sober, and watchful, we're going to be ready. It's not going to overtake us. We're actually going to have a greater expectation. And we're going to be saying to people, get ready. Don't be caught. Unaware. Don't believe the narrative of the day that says peace, safety, security, everything's all right. Be ready. Now, Jameson Fawcett Brown in their commentary says this about this, this particular verse. And I'm just going to read it. Faith, hope, and love are the three preeminent graces. We must not only be awake and sober, but also armed. Not only watchful, but also guarded. The armor here is only defensive. In Ephesians 6, 13 through 17, it's also offensive. Here, therefore, the reference is to the Christian means of being guarded against being surprised by the day of the Lord as a thief in the night. The helmet and breastplate defend the two vital parts, the head and the heart, respectively. With head and heart right, the whole man is right, Edmund says. The head needs to be kept from error, the heart from sin. For the breastplate of righteousness, Ephesians 6.14, we have here the breastplate of faith and love. For the righteousness which is imputed to man for justification is faith working by love, according to those passages of Scripture. Faith as the motive within 
and love exhibited in outward acts constitute the perfection of righteousness. In Ephesians 6, 17, the helmet is salvation here, the hope of salvation. In one aspect, salvation is a present possession. In other words, we have salvation. In another, it's a matter of hope. Why? Because we're looking for a day when even our body will be saved. That was my addition. That wasn't in the notes. Sorry. Our head primarily wore the breastplate of righteousness, that's Jesus, and helmet of salvation that we might, by union with him, receive both. So in other words, I believe Paul's saying to the church and to us as well, that the real key in being prepared, being watchful, watchful, being sober, being vigilant, is to guard your head and your heart. We got to guard our heads and we got to guard our hearts. How do we guard our heads? What are we thinking about? What are we listening to? What, what narrative is determining our day? We don't want to be offended with what we're thinking. We've got to guard our heads. And then we've got to guard our hearts. For we know out of the heart proceed the issues of life. Have, we ever been, have you ever been offended down deep? It will affect what comes out of your heart, what comes out of your life. For God has not appointed us to wrath, verse 9 says, which is, ought to be, everybody in this room ought to shout, Hallelujah! For God has not appointed you to wrath. You are not going to be subjected to the wrath of God. You have gotten on the ark, if you will. Now you might say, well, hold on a second. <laughs> Noah got on the ark, and he had to go through the storm yes he did but he was saved through the storm through the 40 days and 40 nights through the the the, the fountains of the deep breaking loose through the hundred and something days that they were in the boat and then rested on the uh, mountains of Ararat. he was saved through those things but he was in the ark of salvation if you will so let me be very clear. You're not appointed for wrath. But difficulty, tribulation, and problems, you need to understand, are not the wrath to come. You're not immune from trouble. We like to say, well, we're not. Praise God, we're followers of Jesus. We're, we're overcomers in the li this life. And you are. But an overcomer has to have something to overcome. Right? Well, we're victorious in Christ. Well, to be victorious means you had to win over something. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Difficulty, trouble, is promised to the believer. You're going to have difficulty in this life. But that's not God's wrath. So you need to change your perspective. When you fall into divers, temptations, tests, and trials, and all of a sudden you go, oh, woe oh, is me. Why is God letting this happen to me? You might want to adjust your thinking because that's not God's wrath. But that is something that he allows to happen to every believer for their refinement and for their growth and for their strength. You don't know what you can overcome until you have to overcome something. For God has not appointed us to wrath. Difficulty, tribulation, problems are not the wrath to come. You and I in Christ are not destined for wrath, but for the fulfillment of salvation through Jesus Christ. We are to live together with Him. That's what the Scripture tells us in verse 10. And then he ends this section by saying, Therefore comfort each other and edify one another just as as you also are doing. In other words, we ought to comfort one another with these words. We should tell people every day, in some way, shape, form, or fashion, take these words, make them your own, and share it with people. Hey, listen, it's okay. 
You're more than a conqueror in Christ. You're an overcomer. Don't give up. Press in. Push forward. Hey, listen. Protect your heart. I mean, protect your head. Protect your heart. Don't, don't be, don't be, uh, don't be uh, listening to error. Don't, don't listen to a wrong narrative, but believe the truth. And also, protect your heart from offense. Don't be offended in this hour. Stand firm. Hey, listen, it's not going to come on you unaware. You're not, you're not like those who live in the dark. But we need to tell those that are living in the dark to get ready, to prepare, to come to Christ. Because we need to be ready for His return. Let's comfort one another with these words. Amen? This is Paul's admonition to us. Let's do it. Wow. Praise God for His Word. His Word is so alive. It's so comforting. And so today, I just want to say to you, if you've, if you've never said yes to Jesus, if you've never gotten on the ark of God, today's the day. You can say yes, and you can be saved. You can be ready for that day when He returns. Listen, it's not God's will that any should perish or, or that any of people would be destined for wrath in that regard. It's not His will that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. And that's why we're here on this program sharing with you that God's desire is for you to know Him in a real way and that you would be saved. That's His heart. Would you pray with me right now? I just want to uh, ask God to reveal Himself to you. And if you're in that place and you're saying, yeah, my, I know that I need to say yes to Him, then I want you to pray with me. Father, I thank You for Your faithfulness. God, I thank You that it's Your desire that we be reconciled to You. And God, right now, just for those that are watching that would agree with this prayer, Lord, please forgive me of my sin. Just, just say that out loud right where you're at. Just repeat this. Father, forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me and wash me and make me new. I do believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my salvation and that He's coming back again. And today I want to say yes to His Lordship. I want to I lay my life down before Him and say, Jesus, give me Your life in its place. I thank You for what You're doing and what You've done even now. God, I pray for every person that prayed that prayer right there. Lord, that you would meet them right where they're at. God, I ask that you would peel back the overlay of lies and, and, and confusion and that, God, you would cause peace to come to them right now in the name of Jesus. If you prayed that prayer, I want to encourage you to call us at 423-477-0774 or email us at prayer at hosannafellowship.org. God bless you and have a great day.